Born to Read. We're back with another one. Episode Trace. This is a book I haven't read. But I have. But you have. Yes, sir. And you thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah, it was really fun. And I have no idea what it's about. So (laughs) you're going to have to tell me, and I'm going to have to ask questions and see if I understand it. Let's, let's try to keep this in a timely manner. <laughs> so the book is called Presumptive Regeneration or The Baptismal Regeneration of Elect Infants by Cornelius Burgess. Uh, long title, and that's a automatic signal to let you know this book was not written anytime recently. This book was written in about 1640, uh, I believe 1640, by Cornelius Burgess. Cornelius Burgess, in case you don't know, was the chairman of the baptism committee at the Westminster Assembly, where the Westminster Confession of Faith was written. So, uh, that that instantly uh, made me interested in this book. So I was like, this guy has a lot to say, and it'll probably help me understand the Westminster Confession better, and it has. And let me read you Cornelius's prima facie statement, and he, he starts the book off by saying, it reminds me of someone, reminds me of someone alive today where he says, basically, doesn't matter what I say, you guys are going to twist my words and make you say what you want to say, but here's, I'm just going to write this anyways. <laughs> so I was like, all right. Um, but here's his prima facie statement, and he repeats this many times. He says that it is most agreeable to the institution of Christ that all elect infants that are baptized, unless in some extraordinary cases, ordinarily receive the spirit from Christ in baptism for their first solemn initiation into Christ, and for their future future actual renovation in God's good time, if they live to years of discretion, and enjoy the other ordinary means of grace appointed by God to this end. So... Huh? <laughs> so, uh, if you're reading this book, you most likely have already accepted the plausibility, probability, and certainty of infant baptism. Now, the question is, what is this? <clears throat> is this just purely an external sign? Is this just purely a Zwinglian symbol, a naked and bare sign, which John Knox says we utterly damn, and I do too? Or is there something tied to baptism, some sort of spiritual reality annexed unto the water, which is real? Now, that doesn't mean that the water is magic. It doesn't mean that the water is uh, some sort of Popery. That's not what Cornelius's uh, position is. His position is that you receive the Spirit ordinarily at the time of baptism, and it's not because the water is blessed. It's not. It, this isn't Papist theology. This is Reformed theology, and he um, deploys Calvin a lot. I mean, he quotes Calvin more than anybody. And he's like, look, you guys can be against me, but you're against Calvin. You're against Davinit or Davinit. I don't know how to say it. You're against Musculus. You're against Peter Martyr. You're against Cyprian, Augustine. He's like, you can as much as you want, but here's my, here's my squad. Here's what I'm rolling with. And you guys can disagree with me if you want. Uh, but here is my argument. And he has a very sturdy argument. Um, scripturally, he says, look, the circumcision was not reckoned to be circumcision unless the inward reality of the outward sign had actually occurred. Paul says those who are circumcised, who are not circumcised inwardly are not the true circumcision. Then he says, so when you say that you've baptized your child, but you only believe it's an outward sign of something that may or may not have happened, you're not saying your child is baptized. You're not saying that, he's saying you're, you're destroying the definition of baptism. So then you're ending up on that, that front where you're saying uh, baptism doesn't do anything, but then if you don't do it the right way, the thing it doesn't do doesn't happen, right? <laughs> Is that kind of where, where he's running? Yeah. So then, then you're, you end up in a, a position where, okay, so it, the thing it doesn't do didn't happen, so therefore we have to uh, do it again so the thing that right. it doesn't do does happen. <laughs> So when when yeah. when when you use this phrase uh, and it it gives a kind of a 
basic frame of reference when it says presumptive regeneration. Yeah. If you were to simplify that that term down, how would you, you know, in a, in a sentence or two, how would you explain what that means? It means that ordinarily, at the time of baptism, a child is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. However, we do recognize that election does cut through the covenant, but that doesn't mean you operate off of that because you don't know what that, you just, you don't know. So we are given a promise. Um, we're, sh we're told what baptism is and we are to operate off of that. And that's the rule. And, and if a child is not regenerated at that time, that's none of our business. That's not, that's not how we're taught to operate through scripture. It says, as many as have been baptized have put on Christ. That's how scripture talks. So you are presuming that your child has been baptized, I mean, has been baptized with the Holy Spirit at the same time they're baptized with water. So that's, that's where that, that's basically what that means. But what you're saying is what doesn't happen, doesn't happen. Uh, and all the <laughs> gymnastics you're doing. <laughs> um, he, he talks about, uh, Calvin and fighting the Anabaptists and he's telling the people of his day you guys are stupid because he said we are not there's no Anabaptists around us right now and you guys are falling into their traps without them even being here he said but I don't blame you guys because they're not here for us to fight therefore you're falling into error he said but if the Anabaptists were here you guys would be in trouble and because what you guys are saying is there's no benefit in baptism there's no spiritual grace given to the party baptized, but we should still do it. Whereas, but they're still going to display Cornelius's enemies in this topic are still going to say, well, the child should can be saved and the child can have faith. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's the point? Even Anabaptists say, yeah, sure. A child can have faith. Sure. Whatever. But he's saying, unless you think that's ordinary, there's no point and baptizing. That's what the Anabaptist said. He quoted Anabaptists and they're saying, what's the point of baptizing your child if we both agree that this can happen? Cornelius says, we do this because we believe it ordinarily happens, not because it can happen. And he said, this is a means of grace. The, uh, the baptism is a channel by which God gives grace. And he distinguishes between initial regeneration and actual regeneration. Uh, I think I would prefer the words potential regeneration and animated regeneration. Uh, the potential regeneration is, as he describes it, the uh, planting of a tree. The animated regeneration is the growing of the tree. Uh, you are um, potentially, you can drop a pen. You, you can hold a pen over a table and it can potentially drop. And then when you're dropping it, it's actually dropping. So he says when a, when a baby is baptized, it is initially regenerated, meaning it has the changed nature. The Holy Spirit has renewed the child and it will then grow into that nature that the, the child was given. And so that's his, because a lot of people say, well, how's the child going to raise his hands and worship I don't, or whatever, like that display the actual signs. He's like, you're not supposed to. That's not how it works with children. So does that freak you out? So is that is that a a justification versus sanctification? Yeah, kind of, kind of essentially. Thing? That's that's what I'm understanding. Okay. Yeah. So he's like, he's he's pretty much saying they are transplanted from Adam into Christ. Their their federal heads are changed in this baptism, and the fruits of that will show as the baby grows in its faith and grows and and displays habitual uh, graces it will habitually grow to do those things. He said, but that's not, he said, unless you're going to say that all babies are damned in the hell, you, you just, you cannot say that a baby must actually intellectually, rationally be regenerated in order to go to heaven. He says they are initially regenerated. And, uh, he talks about, uh, musk. He brings up musculus quotes, musculus quotes, Calvin talking about infant faith and how infants can have faith. It's not in the same way as us, obviously, but they do. And it saves because the only way to be saved is by faith alone. You cannot have two avenues to fit to uh, salvation. And, so, and the substance of the faith <coughs> is always Christ. Yeah. Right. That right. We're, 
we wouldn't be advocating for two different modes of salvation. Exactly. Right. The, the, the Presbyterian who baptizes their baby is not saying that their baby is saved by any other means than by, by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the Baptist who says baptism needs to happen on a profession of faith by grace in Jesus fr coming from Jesus Christ, that, that both of these things, that this is still kind of an, an in-house debate. Um, and that we're the, the substance at the center of the argument is Christ. And now we're just looking at, uh, what's the train schedule, right? Like right. when does, when does this happen in, in life? Is that, mm -hmm. A, a fair summary. Yeah. And, okay. he, and he's saying like baptism is a means of grace. So to, to not, so to deny your kids baptism is the same as denying them to hear a sermon because that's a way by which God delivers grace. So he's saying like, is it not a means of grace? Is it, or is it not? Uh, and modern day people take the Arminian route, which he describes in their public confessions, believe it's only an external administration of water and that the only means of grace is intellectually understanding the word. Therefore, they must create two avenues to salvation, intellectually understanding and being innocent uh, until you're age eight. Right. So um, it's two things I wanted to bring up. I know we're wrapping up pretty soon, but I wanted to read these quotes from Calvin's catechism that he deploys. He says, what is the meaning of baptism? Answer, it hath in it two parts, for therein both remission of sins and also spiritual regeneration is represented. And a little after this catechism explains the former word, representation. Calvin says, I judge it to be so a figure, that the truth of the thing figured is also annexed to it. For God doth not frustrate our expectation when he promises us his gifts, and therefore it is certain that both remission of sins and regeneration is both offered to us and also received by us in baptism. So that's Calvin. And in the modern day Reformed churches, I don't know if Calvin would be accepted <laughs> for writing that. So Calvin says, uh, and elsewhere in his institutes, does God lie to us and tell us that something's going to happen in this sacrament and it actually doesn't? He doesn't lie to us. He's not tricking us. So, uh, yeah, if you can't tell, I, I kind of like what Burgess has to say here, obviously he has some inconsistencies, but here's the, here's the thing that I really get annoyed by. Um, people say like, oh, presumptive regeneration means you're not going to preach the gospel to your children. It's like, what? And, and Re Burgess brings that up and he's like, have we not answered this objection against the Arminians already? Where they're like, well, just because he's elect, it means you don't have to preach the gospel. He's like, have we not already answered this? Like, this is childish, is pretty much what Cornelius says. He says, nobody but with a cracked brain would levy this accusation. I mean, this it really is dumb. And you say, well, you already think they're safe. <laughs> when a Calvinist asked me that, I'm just like, dude, just, I'm not even going to answer that. It's not even worth my time. Because if we're, if, we're if we're keeping the gospel, the real gospel at the center, um, we'll be acutely aware of our own sin and say, I need the gospel. I right. need repentance all the time. Um, and uh, I think it's, who is it? Uh, Bridges who said, uh, preach the gospel to yourself daily. Uh, yeah. And, and regard, regardless of if you're elect, if regardless of if you're saved or not, you need the gospel. Right. That's, that's the power of God unto salvation. Um, and so we need that. We need that reminder. Every we were, day. we need that reminder that what was dead um, has now been made alive that, mm -hmm. that we we've been uh, made new so the where the Westminster confession only makes a, a brief statement then mm -hmm. on what baptism is and that just kind of as an offhand says and the and that includes the infants of believing parents right, right that, yeah. that this book you would say is then a an exposition of the reasoning behind why that was included in the, in the, in the Westminster say Catechism. This book is a more of an exposition of the reason where it says, uh, where are we? The efficacy of baptism is not tied to the moment of time wherein it is administered yet, notwithstanding by the right use of this ordinance, the grace promised, listen here, the grace promise is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred, by the Holy Ghost, to such, whether of infants or of age, 
as that grace belongeth unto according to the counsel of God's own will in his appointed time. So I think this is an expo- exposition of uh, chapter 28, section 6 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, talking about that in the right use of this ordinance, ordinarily, I'm not saying that this always happens. We are not Lutherans. We are not Papists. But ordinarily, the grace, the promise, the grace is not only offered, but really exhibited and conferred, not by magic water, not by a magic sprite, but by the Holy Ghost. So, uh, that's the... So, when I, when I baptize my child, I will thank God, and I will say thank you, God, for having regenerated my child. And I'm not going to... That's how I'm going to operate, and I think that's most consistent. I think it's consistent with the Westminster Confession of Faith. I think Burgess makes a very good case from Scripture, and um, don't get me wrong, there's a couple places where I was like, what are you saying? Like, he sounded kind of inconsistent. But overall, very good book, very educational, full of amazing distinctions. It's great. Out of 10. Out of what 10. do you give it? I would say a 9 because some of his reasoning felt a little bit faulty to me. Okay. I mean, so who, who would you recommend read this book it, it sound it sounds to me just listening having not read it uh, it sounds a little bit like a thicker read a oh, little, yeah, little yeah, bit more yeah. of a dense read um, not, who, who's who's the intended audience in, in your mind who should be reading this intended audience is those who know their systematic theology you know your baptismal theology um, you know the distinction between regeneration as a christian life and as a moment at the and as a uh, statement of new creation at the moment of um, having faith in Jesus Christ, you, I, I would say hey, this is an advanced word. You need to be pretty well versed in your stuff to understand. All right. Well, the book is Presumptive Regeneration by Cornelius Burgess. It's a fun name. The good reverend. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Born to Read. We'll be back next time with another book review.